So we're going to begin our story back in 1995. For those who know exoplanets will know that indeed there were some pretty momentous things that happened back in 1995. I'm going to mention two of them. You can argue which one was more important. Uh, the first one was indeed, I went to school. Look how cute I looked. This is back, back my first day at school. Now, I've shown this picture to Americans, and they don't have uniforms there. So they think that I chose to go like that, or my, my parents just hate me or something like that. Uh, but there I am. You know, oh God, look how, look how good my hair was back then. So that was 1995, so it was a little while ago. And at the same time, we had something which most people would say was a little more important, was that a couple of Swiss astronomers found the first exoplanet around, around a sun-like star. 51 Pegasus. They realized that if you look at the spectrum of a star, which comes from its uh, you know, somewhat unique combination of atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of the star, if you look at that spectrum over time, it might have a little bit of a wobble in it. And that wobble is indicative of an orbiting planet. And that was really just what kick-started things. Now, ultimately, got them the Nobel Prize, which was kind of, kind of nice for them. And now we have thousands and thousands and thousands of extrasolar planets. What I'd like to say, though, is whilst it is great that we've found all these planets, we have to be careful. We want to not just discover planets, but we really want to understand planets. We really want to understand the galaxy. We want to understand the universe. And one of those things we have to realize is that our distribution of planets is actually quite biased. If you look at the number of stars for a given planetary system, there is a very strong bias for single stars. The vast majority of planets we've found are in single star systems. Whereas if you look at nature, a lot of stars are in binaries or triples or quadruples. One could even argue that most of the interesting things that happen in nature occur in binaries. Yes? So how do you know this, how this stuff, the planets around binaries and triples? Say it again, please. How do you know that? that is actually cool, the that uh, we do, or we don't. This is simply what has been observed. Oh, no, the dashed line is simply stellar multiplicity, the ob surveys of stellar multiplicity out there in nature. And the fact that they don't match up means that we have this strong bias against finding planets in binaries, triples, and such. There may be actual causes in nature for a lack of planets, but as of now, I would say there is still a strong observational bias. So today we're going to talk about how we can try to solve this bias and how we can try and get what I would call a more complete view of the galaxy. So thank you for this introduction. My name is David Mann from The High State University. Now to start, for, to <laughs> oh, it's whatever, it's a postdoc. Now, OK, where is Ohio? Who here that's not American knows where Ohio is? I like this. It's like, this is probably Texas. That's California. Where's Ohio? Is it that guy? Is it that guy? Anywhere here? All right, this is Ohio, obviously. So there we go. Now, I wanted to uh, tell you about, you know, where I want to give you something that you could relate to. So, obviously, what can Melbournians relate to? We have the greatest day of the year coming up, Saturday. Melbourne football grounds here. Of course, our greatest sport in the world. If you're maybe not Australian, you're new to this country, and you've had to sit through all this COVID crap, watch the game on Saturday. It's fantastic. And so, if I want to, like, sell Ohio State to Melbournians, I can say, well, we've actually got... A bigger stadium. Ours is even bigger than the MCG. It's one of only five in the world that's bigger than the MCG. Football is such a passion at Ohio State that we even have a cathedral to our football team. That's how much we care about it. We also have the best marching band in the land. Furthermore, that wasn't even Ohio. That was Indiana. You were not paying attention. That's Ohio right there. Or is it? So let's, all right, let's get going. Let's actually find some planets. Let's try and solve this single star bias. I'm going to zoom in on these planets around two stars. I'm going to say there are two types. There's going to be a so-called S-type, a so-called P-type. These are really crappy names. I'm going to use once, then I'm going to can them. S-type, satellite type, is where you've got a planet just orbiting a single star, and then that single star has another single star in a wide binary. So this is kind of similar to finding planets around single stars. Often you just find a planet around a single star and you later say, oh wait, there was another star there. This is what you might refer to as like an outer companion or a stellar perturb or something like that. 
I'm more interested in the circumbinary case, where you've got the tight binary and the planet on the outside, and you very much know that you are orbiting two stars. It is very important to both the discovery and the analysis. And this is indeed the archetypal Tatooine sunset, you know, Luke looking up at the double sunset before his aunt and uncle get killed. Now, I'm going to focus on this for a few reasons. Why? Well, you might say, well, it's cool. They are pretty cool. Like, so combining planets are cool. It's a bloody Tatooine out there. That is cool. And that is, you know, it's a kind of sad day in astronomy where you can't just do something because it is cool. But it's not necessarily the number one reason for it. Number two. 30% of stars are binaries, give or take 50% of multiples. So if we want to understand the galaxy, we do have to understand all of the stars, not just the easy ones. But I think ultimately the best reason for studying circumbinary planets, and one I'm going to hopefully show to you today, is that they probe planet formation in an extreme environment. They probe planet formation in an environment where we thought it maybe wasn't even possible. And so if we can find planets around binaries, or in some cases not find them, we're going to actually have this unique laboratory to see how planets form in general. Luckily, we have some circumbinary planets. Uh, unfortunately, the field of exoplanets doesn't have beautiful images like some of you folks do in galaxies, but we do have beautiful artist impressions. This is Kepler-16, a transiting planet around an eclipsing binary. So that means that the Kepler telescope sees this nice edge-on system where the two stars pass in front of each other and the planet passes in front of each star. Now, if you were to instead look at this from the top down, you're going to see the two stars are going their barycentric orbit and then the planet goes around the common center of mass. With Kepler, we've got this nice little sample. It's a small sample, but I'm going to say it's somewhat informative, about a dozen of these planets. And they come in somewhat different shapes and sizes. And I'm going to go through some of the trends we've seen so far. Some, I'll go, some of the trends I'll go through in you know, shorter detail and some in a bit longer detail. As a sort of quick summary, all of the planets we have found so far are coplanar. The planet and the binary are neatly aligned within a couple of degrees, very much like we have in the solar system, at least for the big bodies in the solar system. We're going to see later how we can maybe break out of what I believe is an observational bias, but this is what we have so far. Planets seemingly do not care about the mass ratio of the binary. You could have two big stars, a big star and a small star. Two small stars doesn't really matter too much to the planet, at least based on these preliminary studies. However, the planet does care about the separation of the binary. It seems that the really tight binaries, by tight I mean orbital periods of a few days, lack planets, whereas the slightly wider binaries, periods of 10, 20, 30 days, have planets. That is very much a talk in of itself. One very important trend we've seen is that the planets are so-called piled up. By that I mean if we consider a binary, a binary is going to have a stability limit as we've heard about in a few talks over the last couple of days. This stability limit does have a fine structure as a function of resonances and such, but roughly speaking in terms of a ratio of say major axes, ratio of about three, rough order of magnitude. And we have found all of these planets basically as close as possible to the binary. If these planets were any closer, they would have been ejected, and so we wouldn't have seen them. Now, why is this? Well, we think that it's not purely an observational bias. This was some of my old work. It might have an element of it, but not a sole observational bias. There is a nice physical reason for why you might have this, though. We think that the planets don't actually form there because the disk has been carved out and you have a huge hole and then these planets are just on the outside of this hole, where the disk, yes, it exists, but it's highly turbulent at this truncation. We think it is more likely that the planets form farther away, migrate in, and then they stop basically at just outside this hole, where there is a strong pressure bump in the disk. Again, a talk in of itself, but this is the, you know, a pretty popular theory for how these planets formed. One trend we have also seen and this is one that really stands out, is that all of the planets we have seen around binaries are gas giants. Here I'm showing the distribution of planets around single stars, and we see most of the planets are small. So this is the Earth, and Neptune will be here at about four Earth radii. 
Most of the planets we've found around single stars are these so-called super-Earths or mini-Neptunes, basically things of a couple of Earth radii. And we have seen that the abundance of planets around binaries is similar at the gas giant level, and they're all gas giants. And this trend really stands out. All of these radii of all the circumbinary planets are on the tail of this distribution. So where are all the small circumbinary planets? It really stands out. Where are the circumbinary super-Earths? So for this, I'm actually going to pose a slightly broader question. Where indeed do these super-Earths come from? Because if we look in our solar system, there isn't a super-Earth. We've got the Earth at one Earth radii, then absolutely nothing until we get to Neptune and Uranus at about four Earth radii. But out there in the galaxy, loads of things are super-Earths. So it is a big question, where do they come from? Pardon? Mars. Mars is even smaller than the Earth. It's Pardon? It's not, nothing. it's not nothing, but it's not in between Earth and Neptune. Yeah, and Mars, in fact, is even smaller than we would, models would maybe predict, which is, again, another talk. <laughs> so where do they come from? And indeed, if I throw out an analogy here, if you think about uh, cosmology, which I've summarized in dark stuff versus normal stuff, that's basically my knowledge of cosmology, super-Earths are, let's say, the dark matter of exoplanets. They're the most common but we don't have them in our neighborhood, and we're really not sure where it comes from. So let's try and answer the question of where does exoplanet dark matter come from? So two basic points of view. You could have the planet form bang in situ. So it forms in the part of the disk where we currently see it orbit. That's one option. The other option is that it forms farther out in the disk and migrates inwards. Now, migration does not always have to be inwards, but it's largely inwards. This is one of the interesting astrophysics debates where I think there's actually a pretty even debate. People are going back and forth on this, and there are definitely a lot of theories. I am not going to argue for one theory or the other, but I'm going to try and perform an experiment. We're going to use a laboratory. We're going to say, well, how about if I just turn off one of these two options, i.e., I turn off in situ formation by replacing that star with a binary. We believe that around a binary in situ formation is not possible because the disk has either been completely cleared away or you have this highly turbulent region where it would be very hard to cohesively form a planet. Why is it highly turbulent? Because just in here it's been completely destroyed. So here it was so turbulent that it got ripped apart, whereas this is super turbulent. So the only mechanism I would say that is viable for planet formation around a binary is indeed to form them farther away and migrate in. So we're going to take this, I dare say, big picture question. Where do super-Earths come from? The most common planets in the galaxy, we'd really like to know that. And let's try and break it down into this smaller niche of, well, if we do or do not find them around binaries, that will tell us a lot. But to know whether or not we could find them around binaries, let us consider how do you find small planets? Because if you have the Sun and the Earth, it looks like this. To scale, it's barely a pixel on this projector. And that means that when you want to see a transit of a planet in front of a star, your individual transits may look pretty crappy. Even if you have something as amazing as Kepler, that little dip in the light curve that you expect because a planet passes in front of it is going to be really small. What you need to do is take a whole bunch of those little dips, add them together to build up your signal to noise. And you can do this around a single star because the transits occur periodically. So we know that if one occurs at 10 days and one occurs at 20, there's also going to be one at 30, 40, 50, 60. You cannot do this around a binary because the two stars keep bloody moving. So the transit timing variations caused by predominantly the geometry of the binary onto the planet mean that it could transit a huge range of positions, therefore a huge range of times something which we worked out of, geez, about 10 years ago. And it's not just the three-body geometry, but the three-body dynamics. The orbit of the planet around the binary may be perturbed over time through various mechanisms. That is to say, if you just take all of these methods, which have been really successful at finding small planets around single stars, and then just take them out of the box, put them in to a binary, they don't work. They just wash away the signal because the things do not stack up coherently. So this means that all of those planets found by I were 
Uh, well, indeed, they were found by I. So it's great for something like Planet Hunters, which is the exoplanet version of Galaxy Zoo. It's also great for people who have great eyes. You find an eclipsing binary, you look through, and you try to see a little tertiary dip. That's great for finding some planets, but only big planets, because those individual transits have to be significant. So to try and solve this with Dan Fabricry, we tried to create our brand new algorithm, which would actually account for the three-body uh, geometry and the three-body dynamics. So you could take transits, which had variable timing, variable duration, and stack them coherently to build up the significance. Now, this uh, was a you know, somewhat complex code. Uh, there's a lot of details. I could tell you about the details. It's a 30-page paper, but most of you don't care about the details, if I'm being honest. And even if you did care, you're not really going to remember them. So I'll give you the punchline, that Stanley is an n-body grid search. It is, I would dare say, a brute force search. It is conceptually quite simple. The devil's in the details, but it's conceptually quite simple. We create a huge grid of models using an n-body code that accounts for the three-body geometry and dynamics. And we create a transit mask for each little point in that grid, fit it to the data, see if it works. If it does, it's a planet. If it doesn't, it's nothing. That is essentially how it works. But I also really want you to remember Stanley, though. So Stanley was not just named after anything. Stanley was named after my beautiful, like, 70-pound sort of Labrador Shepherd mix. This was his birthday earlier in the year. We went to the local dog bakery to get his Stanley cake because, of course, he's got his little birthday hat on here. And so Stanley is the source of all of my love and sleepless nights. There he is there. He's very adorable. Stanley actually came from a Peruvian KFC dumpster. That's a true story. Aww. So let's apply Stanley. First, let's try to find all of those known planets. Kepler-16 was the first found circumbinary planet, and this is what their transits look like. It looks like a model. It's so perfect. The data is just so perfect. And Stanley has picked out all the transits in red. Now, you didn't need anything fancy to find that. You could have seen it by eye, of course. But Stanley does pick out the weird transit timing. If we look at that grid, I said that Stanley is a grid search, we really see that this is a needle in a haystack type operation. Because here, the color indicates how good your fit is. And everything's blue means that everything's crap, except for this tiny little needle in a haystack. You have to get your parameters precise if you want to be able to match up all those transits, because it's a very, very sensitive function. Another way of looking at it is to say, well, our signal detection efficiency, which is basically a periodogram. If I see a spike above 8, I get happy. So at 14,000, you know, it's probably, probably there. And this is here at the period of Kepler-16. And over here, it's at two times the period. Often with periodograms, you can get these aliasing effects. But OK, finding Kepler-16 was, I dare say, too easy. We want to do something a bit better. Kepler-47 the smallest known circumbinary planet, three Earth radii. It's the absolute limit of what I dare say can be found by eye. We see the transits now are visible by eye, but admittedly, I would say a good eye. And Stanley finds it with a spike here at about double the SDE you would need to claim a detection, or at least to be excited. So Stanley finds, I dare say, quite easily. But OK, we want to push even farther. So let's say, could we have found the known planets if they were smaller than what we see them. So Kepler-16 is about the size of Saturn. But could we have seen it if it was the size of two Earth radii, a super-Earth? Now, a transit of Kepler-16 at two Earth radius actually still looks pretty good by eye. It's just a really bright system. It's just beautiful, stable. It's an amazing light curve. So yes, we could have found it. You would still get this huge spike. And on our little plot here, you would still get this nice little overlap where we find it. But now, could we have found Kepler-16 if it was one Earth radii? Could we have found a circumbinary Earth? This is what the transit would look like. It's just sort of, you know, it's kind of barely above the sort of residual stellar activity there. Nothing special. Indeed, this is, I dare say, the limit of Stanley, because you've got this spike, which is just, it's at the right period, and it's just above our threshold of detectability. And if we look at that grid, we see that everything is just absolute crap. It's absolute noise, except this tiny little needle in the haystack, which shows that we could find a small Earth-sized circumbinary planet. Yeah. What's the phase? Uh, the planet's phase. 
So planet's period, planet's phase. We also, the grid also con contains the planet's eccentricity and the planet's omega. We do it with, we search over four parameters. Each search has about a million give or take parameters, million give or take grid points, so it can take tens of tens or even hundreds of CPU hours. It is a slow process, but luckily we have computing clusters. So you're seeing all these coplanarity? There is so there is an assumption of coplanarity. If something is not coplanar, then the timing won't get affected too much, but you will see the planet's orbit sort of rock back and forth a bit, which means sometimes you actually miss transits. In that case, we would fold some noise on top because we would have said we assume there's a transit here, but it's misaligned a little bit, so it missed it. Uh, we can still find misaligned planets, but at a lower signal to noise threshold. So ultimately, whereas these were the discovered planets, we showed that we could have discovered them down here. So for about half the systems, we could have actually found them in this huge regime where we are completely missing known planets today. So now let's actually try to apply it to the data. Let's actually try and find new planets. So far, we've, this is a you know, brand new algorithm, so we've done a preliminary initial search. This was working with an Ohio State undergraduate, Hannah Parsons. Uh, the computer's on fire because it very much is computationally quite intensive. So we took 200 of the best eclipsing binaries. Let's see what we could find. Now, the number of planets known before we searched in Kepler was 12. So 12 planets. Again, grand finals on the weekend. Melbourne Demons had 12 premierships. And just like these planets, we worked very hard to find those premierships. Is that Ron Barassi? That is Ron Barassi. Furthermore, there was a little bit of a gap in between that 12th premiership and the 13th premiership. Indeed, a planet had not been found for a while because we kind of reached the limit of our bi-eye detections. We have now taken the number to 13, both in planets and premierships. Not going to lie, my trip to Australia was not, you know, coincidental with being here in September. But it didn't work out this well for me this year. So we have taken the number from 12 to 13, which, you know... We're excited. I'm not sure I was as excited as Jack Viney, but I was still pretty excited. But let's actually look at what we found. So this is KIC 10 blah, something. I need the crappy names. We've got a big primary transit and a big secondary transit. By that I mean we see the planet pass in front of the big star and in front of the small star. And you look at those transits, you say, geez, those look pretty obvious by eye. Like that didn't need anything fancy. Well, the thing is that in nature, things don't really look like flat dip, flat dip, flat dip. They really look more like this. We've got all of these variations due to both stellar activity. St stars might have spots. Stars might have pulsations. Stars might have ellipsoidal variation. And you've also got instrumental variations, such as certain pixels are not as sensitive as other pixels. So indeed, 70%, I dare say, of the work going into Stanley was about taking crappy looking light curves like this and turning them into nice looking light curves where it really is straight dip, straight dip, straight dip. And I'm also going to temper this discovery a little bit to say that yes, we did discover it independently. We didn't need to know it was there, but it definitely had been found by eye by people before. So it's sort of a new-ish discovery, I'm going to be honest. And furthermore, as you could expect by something such a deep transit, it really is another gas giant. It's sort of about here somewhere. So even though we had the sensitivity to go into this small region, we seemingly haven't, which makes us beg the question, why not? So we did a very classic thing of injection retrieval. You create a distribution of planets, put it into the data, and see what you could get out. And so we said, under the null hypothesis that the planets around one and two stars are the same, let us inject the single star distribution in and see what we get back. And single stars where small planets are about eight to one more common than big planets. In red is what we found. Those are the 13 gas giants. In blue is what we found from the injections. If we break it down at three Earth radii, we see that we found as many gas giants as we expected. Because the, the uh, abundance of planets around one and two stars of the gas giant regime is kind of the same. But for small planets, we expected to find about just as many. 
we should have found 14 and we found zero. Now, of course, we would like to expand this from a sample of 200 eclipsing binaries to 2,000, of course, and this is what we're trying to do. But as a preliminary result, we can say the size distribution of planets around one and two stars is different. Planets at the gas giant regime seemingly don't care if you've got one or two stars. But for small planets, they seemingly don't like two stars to some extent. Why? Let's take the observer's hat off, put on the theory hat. Let's not ask, do they exist? We've kind of said, well, seemingly they don't, or at least the abundance is lower. But let us ask, should they exist? Indeed, we have two theories, two branches of theory. One is, like I said earlier, maybe small planets just have to form in situ. They like to form in the inner regions of disks around single stars. And that's just not a go around binaries because that inner region of the disk has just been thrown away or too turbulent. They just can't do it. That's one possibility. And indeed, that's the possibility I really thought going into this. There's now actually a second possibility. Maybe the planets do form. And they do still have this idea they form farther away in a binary and then migrate inwards. And it's not a question of can you form a small planet around a binary, but can you keep it? Can it survive? i.e. could there be a way of migration killing circumbinary super-Earths? So, we're all going to play a game together. This game, circumbinary squid game. We're going to see which of these planets actually survive. The ringleader was my undergrad student, Evan Fitzmaurice. He did his own squid game, as in he got into grad school. Don't think he killed anyone. I don't ask questions. We have two theories that we came up with of why migration could potentially kill small planets around binaries. Two theories. One, companions kill the planet. We have this paradigm that the binaries have cleared out a hole in the disk and a planet, let's say a super Earth, migrates in, he stays there. He's happy, he doesn't want to go any further because that would make him unstable, but he's fine. Now what happens if another planet comes in, maybe a mini Neptune, it migrates in. And now, whereas the super-Earth doesn't want to go any closer, it's going to now start to interact with the mini-Neptune because they're getting closer. In particular, they could interact at a resonance, for example, a 2 to 1. At this point, the mini-Neptune is still being pushed inwards by the disk. And since it is locked in resonance with the super-Earth, that will also get pushed in closer. And by pushing the super-Earth closer means that the mini-Neptune has essentially kicked it out of the system. And then the mini Neptune comes in and takes its spot. So this would actually be a way of biasing the observed distribution of small planets. Because yes, you formed a lot of small planets, but they got kicked out by the bigger planets. And this is a mechanism that would happen around two stars, but not around one. And we actually show this to be, I dare say, very effective. If we simulate, so we have a simple disk prescription and some simple prescriptions for migration and stochastic forcing. It's, it's not as fancy as Daniel's stuff, but a couple of simple things. If we put in a flat distribution, or let's say a, a log flat distribution, and then you look at the surviving distribution, very much it tails off its small planets. The big ones can survive, and the small ones often get kicked out. Or they survive, but on a quite wide orbit. So this is actually quite effective. But the caveat is, of course, that we require a second planet. And yes, multi-planets are quite common, but you're still making a fairly big assumption. So we decided to do another theory, a second theory where we removed the need for having two planets. Maybe that single planet, that single small planet, migrates too slowly. Now, why would that matter? Well, around these binaries, you're going to have these mean motion resonances, meaning that the planet and binary are moving. Uh, so the planet would orbit, let's say, 100 days, and the binary orbits around every 20 days. That would be a 5 to 1 mean motion resonance. Mean motion means orbital frequency, yeah. non-planet. Non um, so just like Jupiter's moons, just like Pluto and Neptune. Now, resonances sometimes could be stabilizing, but often around a binary, these resonances can actually be destabilizing. Now, even though the observed planets obviously are stable because we observed them, they had to get to their current positions by passing through different mean motion resonances, which themselves may have been unstable. 
Now the effect the planet's mass would have on it is that planets migrate at a speed proportional to their mass in the type 1 regime. So small planets migrate slowly, whereas bigger planets migrate quickly. So whereas a big planet may be able to pass quickly through an unstable resonance, it can run the gauntlet and survive, a small planet kind of dawdles, it kind of walks very slowly and he gets stuck in there. And this is what we thought could explain a lack of small planets. It turns out that this method, or this, this theory we came up with, is I dare say, you know, it sort of works, but with a bit of a caveat. Again, if you inject a nice flat distribution, your observed distribution does have a tail off. You do see preferentially small planets get ejected. This method does sort of work, but the caveat is that we had to make the disk really, really turbulent. Basically, those resonances were not as unstable, they're not as destabilizing as we perhaps expected. So this method, it works, but it's maybe not the most effective. So I'd say that ultimately, out of these two theories, we think that in-situ formation really doesn't work. We think that migration also could kill these small planets. So what do we do now? You might just say, well, let's just find more planets. That's always great. Let's find more planets. The issue with TESS, which is kind of the evolution of Kepler, is that whereas Kepler was beautifully designed for circumbinary planets, TESS really isn't. The challenge is that these planets have quite long periods, 50, 100, 200 days. And so Kepler, who looked at a tiny patch of the sky for four years straight, was perfectly designed for it. Whereas TESS, which looks at the entire sky, but typically for just a small amount of time, like 30 days or 60 days, is not designed well. So one option is you could look up near the so-called continuous viewing zones, where all of these little patches of time add up to quite a long time. We've done that before. We found a planet that way. You could also try and get creative. You can say, well, let's say we've got a 100-day planet, and we've only got 30 days of data. Sure, that would normally just get you one transit around a single star, but around a binary, you could get two transits because it passes both stars, this so-called one-two punch. And again, this is a way of finding planets but not going to lie, it's very labor intensive. I don't know if you've realized, but the entire sky contains a lot of stars. You've got to look for a lot of stuff to find a small amount of planets. So it's not necessarily a scalable way. I think that a better way to find circumbinary planets moving forward is not necessarily to look at, say, TESS, but to say, well, maybe we don't even need transits. Maybe we could just see some sort of imprint of the planet in the binary that isn't a transit. So we've talked about how the binary imposes TTVs onto the planet due to its three-body geometry, three-body dynamics. But it actually also goes the other way. The planet can invoke, invoke ETVs on the binary, eclipse timing variations, because the planet's gravity, whilst small, is not zero. Now, historically, we have used these ETVs on the transiting planets. So on the left, we have Kepler-16, and we have the ETV over time. And we see these things that are on the order of minutes. So they're small. The signal to noise is not huge, but it's detectable. And since the ETVs are a gravitational effect, they tell us how massive that third body was. And it lets us say, well, Kepler-16 was about the mass of Saturn. We could also use it for a system like on the right for Kepler-413. No, the ETVs are, let's say, non-detected. This is basically compatible with zero, but they still let us provide an upper limit on the planet's mass, which means we can say it's a planet. So ETVs traditionally used for the transiting planets. But you can also use them even if the planet doesn't transit. You could just find any old eclipsing binary and see ETVs and deduce the existence of the non-transiting planet. Sure, you don't know anything about the radius of the planet, but you could still say something about the period and the mass of the planet. And this is actually what was done by a few folks up at University of Southern Queensland, uh, maybe known to some of the people in this room. This system, KIC 509 whatever, has these beautiful ETVs. It's a really bright binary. The ETVs, the signal to noise is huge, very obvious, not at all controversial. And they use these to deduce the existence of a circumbinary planet with a period of about 250 days and a mass of about seven or eight times the mass of Jupiter, which would be cool. The period was pretty normal, but the mass would have been the biggest known. It would have been a really cool discovery. Furthermore, they proposed this really wacky orbit, something that's almost like polar. So the binary is doing this and this planet is doing this. 
And this again would be super cool and actually not that bizarre because we have, for example, we know disks. Daniel will know of disks with uh, misaligned polar orbits. Even, it's even a potential stable point for a, an evolving disk where you could have the binary goes like this and the disk is orientated sort of 90 degrees. That's not crazy. So to find a, let's say, polar planet doesn't sound crazy. But we wanted to look into this a little more. We wanted to look at the existing data and also take some more data. So this was led by Max Goldberg. He was an undergrad I worked with at Chicago. Now he's off to Caltech for PhD. If we look at purely the eclipse timing variations and look at how well we can, they fit the data, then I'm plotting here uh, the, basically the angle between the two orbits, omega, and the, uh, so the, the rotational angle between the two orbits and also the inclination angle between the two orbits. That is to say something at, right here at the pole would be exactly coplanar, something here would be exactly polar, and something here would be coplanar but flipped, 180 retrograde. And color just means good fit. So indeed, there were sort of these three possible orbits. You've either got something that's coplanar or you've got something like this, which is something what Getley had thought. If you just have timing, this is fine. But what you also have to consider is not just how the timing of the eclipses changes, but how the depth of the eclipses change. What I've shown here is every single eclipse in the data phase folded, stuck together. And we see that there is absolutely no evolution. We've counted for the ETVs, but there's no evolution in depth. Whereas the solution proposed by Getley where you've got this really massive polar planet tugging on the binary's orbit would mean the binary's orbit would change orientation over time and definitely in a noticeable amount over four years of Kepler. I, it would sort of slide, I can't remember which way it slides, but it slides significantly. So whilst the transit timing or the eclipse timing makes it possible, the eclipse depth variations say this is not possible. The only way you can have zero eclipse depth variations is to be coplanar or retrograde or one of these kind of weird orientations where you're sort of polar or highly misaligned but you're in this sort of stationary orbit where the dynamics is actually it's not really moving. Furthermore we actually got radial velocity so Getley did not have radial velocity, didn't have the benefit of that and our radial velocities let us know more about the binary than what they could pull out from purely the photometry. So overall, we say that Getley made this really, really cool discovery. They discovered this real circumbinary planet. It's very big. Our mass is a bit different, but I mean, whatever, it's big. It's, our period is basically the same. But unfortunately, the, the coolest aspect of their discovery, I dare say, is probably not real. And I think ETVs really could be this great way of unlocking these misaligned planets, trying to, again, probe planet formation at the extreme, but unfortunately not in this particular example. To conclude, what about radial velocities? This is what uh, Michel Mayo and Didier Callot managed to do back in 1995. It's, I dare say, the original method for finding extrasolar planets. So how come none of these planets around binaries have been found with it, despite it being such an old, well-used, well-understood method? So to try and solve this, we created what we call the Bebop Radial Velocity Survey. This one is actually an acronym. I think it's kind of cute. It is not one of my animals. What, by doing with radial velocities, there's a few differences to transits. Firstly, we are probing planets by mass, not radius. It's a gravitational effect as opposed to a shadowing effect. And I dare say that mass is a more fundamental parameter of a planet. Radial velocities have a period bias. It's easier to find close-in stuff, but it's not as sharp of a bias as you get around transits. And finally, you can actually see inclined orbits, again, with radial velocities. You don't have this strict geometric requirement that everything is super nicely aligned. But, you know, as is always the case, there are challenges. There are reasons why this method has existed since the mid-90s but never been used successfully before. Challenge number one, we have two stars. The two stars induce in each other this very big radial velocity amplitude, purely from their Keplerian motion. And this is going to be kilometers per second. And our challenge is to try and find a residual little wobble on the order of meters per second due to the planets. So talking about orders of magnitude difference. 
That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is to get that radial velocity, you have to be able to take a spectrum and see how it moves over time. But two stars means two spectrums, two spectra. And indeed, these two spectra are moving back and forth across each other. They are blended. So these are all really challenging. What we actually did with Bebop was, I dare say, we kind of cheated. We said, well, how about we don't look at those binaries where the two stars are both really bright? Let's look at a binary more like this where one star is bright and one star is really small, a so-called single line eclipsing binary. We know actually from the transit surveys that planets are found around binaries of all types of mass ratios. So why not look at the types of binaries which would be easier to observe? And that's what we've done. So essentially finding a planet around a single line eclipsing binary is kind of akin to finding a multi-planet system. So what we started off with, and this was one of my PhD projects, was to do a big survey with Coralie. Coralie is the, uh, the spectrograph made by the Swiss on the Swiss telescope. As a function of the detectable period of planets, so if it gets farther away, it's harder to find, and the detectable mass of planets, i.e. if it gets smaller, it's harder to find, we have this completeness map, i.e. everything up here we could find, and sort of down here we could find maybe half the time, and down here we could never find anything down here. And with Bebop, we found five circumbinary objects. But they're up here, they're all triple stars. Much easier to find, much more massive. We could have found loads of circumbinary brown dwarfs. We even could have found a lot of circumbinary planets akin to that Getley discovery, sort of six, seven Jupiter masses. But we didn't. And indeed, the known transiting planets with the measured mass are sort of down here. So it maybe wasn't that surprising. We really were pushing the boundaries, but we didn't quite break into that parameter space. So we need to do this. We need to break to longer periods and also find smaller mass planets. And that's what has been some of my more recent work. So we upgraded. We literally upgraded because we went from the Swiss telescope up the hill to HARPS, just right up here. And the ad advantage of using HARPS is you get this insane precision. You go from something that's like eight meters per second down to two meters per second. I mean, just to think about that for a second. I mean, this is like, this is two meters per second. I mean, we can measure a star wobbling at this level light years away. And that wobble is due to a planet. So that is, I think, just quite astounding. The variations in how the spectrum moves are well sub-pixel level. It's insane. We also expanded the survey up to the north, so we can cover you know, the second half of the sky. And we even got a few little nights to dabble on espresso, which is the latest version of HARPS. The idea is that HARPS is on one four meter telescope and espresso is either on a single eight meter telescope or you can combine four eight meter telescopes to make an effective 16 meter telescope, which is just huge. And with this, with these upgrades, with these continuous surveys, we actually made the first ever radial velocity detection of a circumbinary planet. Now, I'm really emphasizing the word detection, not discovery, but detection, because this was actually Kepler-16, a known transiting system, something to really do as a proof of concept. We see the binary orbit, kilometers per second. Really, really obvious. There are error bars on this, but you can't see it. It's beads on a string. But then in the residuals that binary fit, you see a periodogram with a really nice spike at a period exactly where we expect it. And so we can see the radial velocity fit of Kepler-16. Now, for those who are maybe not used to uh, radial velocity fits, that looks really good. I mean, that's, that's just beautiful. And this is able to fit the data without any use of the photometry at all. It's purely fitting the radial velocities. But of course, we compare to the photometry. Now, the period matches exactly, and the mass matches really well. The rate of velocity math perfectly matches that eclipse timing variation mass, which is nice. And that's also actually a pretty rare comparison because those Kepler targets with TTV masses are often really faint. So it's really hard to do follow-up observations. But okay, this is the first ever detection. This is not a new discovered planet. We definitely didn't discover Kepler-16. The first discovery came on another system. EBLM J0608. Now this guy I think has an interesting history. This is actually a Bebop target. We have been observing this with Bebop since about 2013. 
And then we hadn't seen anything using Coralie. Then Tess came along and Tess actually found transits. It's like, oh yeah, there you go, there's some transits. So we found a transiting planet in this target, which we'd already been looking at for radial velocities. So then we said, oh, well, let's actually try to get the mass of this transiting planet, just like we did with Kepler-16. So we went from Coralie to Harps and from Harps to Espresso. Ultimately, our data shows this. We have a huge spike at the eclipsing binary period, as you would expect. It's very easy to spot an eclipsing binary. And we have a big spike over here, but at a period that does not correspond to the transiting planet. We do not see the transiting planet in the data, even though we know it must be there. The solution to that is that the planet is most likely very inflated, meaning it's got a nice big radius, which makes it easy to find with transits, but a really small mass, which makes it really hard to find with radial velocities. We think it's actually a quite puffy planet, which could actually speak to its formation. But we can find this additional planet. So this here is, I guess you'd say, TOI1338C, the second planet found in the system and the first ever planet found with radial velocities. Again, the individual data points maybe look a little crappy, but as we know is important now, if you phase fold them together, stick them together, you have this nice clear sinusoid. So this is the second ever multi-planet circumbinary system. And if we think back to how the interactions work between two planets, like why didn't this planet kick out the inner one and stuff like this? Well, these two planets are beyond any of those resonances. It's a 90 day period and about a 210 day period. So they're nice and safe. Furthermore, we have a few extra discoveries of Bebop coming, purely blind discoveries. This would be a new circumbinary planet. This would be not a circumbinary planet, but a really eccentric circumbinary brown dwarf, which I think could be pretty cool. So to summarize, what have we learned throughout this? At least what have I learned over the past few years? Well, for starters, we've all learned where Ohio is. We all agree we know where Ohio is. Okay, good. That wasn't Ohio. That was bloody Illinois. This is Ohio. This is 100%. I guarantee that is where Ohio is. No, no, you trust me anymore. No, you trust me at all. We have learned that the size distribution of planets is different around one and two stars. Of course, preliminary, 100%. We're trying to really find out not just is it uh, different, but we want to understand how different it is. So that's really the ongoing work. We think that in situ formation is a no-no around binaries. Migration, on the other hand, you know, maybe. We think that eclipse timing variations really do open new doors. We can find new planets, misaligned planets, probe new parameter spaces with ETVs, but we do have to be careful to look at not just ETVs, but also other sources of information. And finally, I dare say that radial velocities do work. It takes persistence. We spent four years on Bebop with Coralie, couldn't quite get there, and now suddenly by going to an instrument that's just a bit better, the discoveries have come. So sometimes we just need that little bit of persistence, which I think is a nice life, le life lesson. And so ultimately, I think binaries are worth the effort. It takes a bit of effort, but I think they're worth it. And I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. Oh, yes. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so you are saying, uh, is this, yeah, wonderful. That's a really good question. So the distribution of planets around single stars indeed has a peak here, a peak here, and obviously a fair few planets here, but it's a bit less. Uh, this is the so-called Fulton Gap after this here. The guy actually calls it that as well. He's really drinking his own bathwater. Um, <laughs> but uh, otherwise known as the Radius Valley. This kind of separates so-called super-Earths and mini-Neptunes. Why is this the case? One possibility is that uh, planets will come in, and depending on their separation from the star, their atmosphere actually might get stripped back from the, from the star. So the planets actually have similar masses, but the atmosphere gets stripped away depending on the mass of the planet, which means that you sort of go, if you're here, you can keep your atmosphere, but if here, your atmosphere actually gets stripped away, which reduces your radius, pushing you to here. So you get this sort of bimodal thing. Uh, this distribution was only found after we got better stellar parameters because ultimately we don't measure planet radii. We measure the radius ratio between the planet and the star. And until we improved our stellar parameters, we didn't actually know this. We just thought it was like a big hump. But yeah, great question. And, and indeed, if we could see around binaries, 
this distribution or indeed maybe not see it, that would tell us a bit about it. So uh, I was wondering why you're so against in situ formation, uh, given that I mean, planets migrate to that uh, place outside the planet. Yeah. I mean, that's also where the dust migrates to. Yeah. Yeah, I th I thought that, and a few other th folks thought that. You got a lot of stuff there, no doubt, but the stuff is moving very quickly. I mean, it, under the paradigm under the paradigm of um, core accretion model for forming planets, you need to stick things together, going all the way from the dust size all the way up through you know rock size to asteroid size to planet size. You need to pass through all of these different orders of magnitude and to coherently stick things together. And the challenge, I believe, when you are that close, uh, that close to the disk, is uh, disk edge, is that the relative velocities are so high. If I just bring it up here. Um, the relative velocity between two particles that may be really close to each other is so high that basically they wouldn't stick together, but they will basically just shatter. So that, that's, the, that's the idea. And that's definitely. You know, uh, I wasn't the one who thought of that. But we do observe uh, large dust grains piled up at that location. Dust, so large dust grains. Okay, so, but even if you observe large dust grains, I guess you've gone through, you know, one of the stages of planet formation. But could it go all the way through to forming a planet? I guess that would be the that would be the challenge. You have something that's because even in radio wave ones, you get uh, something looking like rings. Mm -hmm. Like this VLA kind of so, as in. That's sort of centimeter sized particles piling up. There. Okay. It's halfway there. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested. And of course, uh, you know, when we were finding these planets, this was all pre Alma. So if Alma comes and changes the whole theory, you know, that's cool. <laughs> Happy for that. And is it around binary stars or small stars? That well, um, the origin of these cavities is, is not controversial to us, but for the field of use. I mean, in many cases, you don't know that it's a binary. We assume that that's why there's a hole in the middle of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, uh, you know, a kind, it's a kind of a cop out answer, but there definitely have been a lot of people tried to form planets in situ and they, they struggle. Uh, even though, indeed, as you say, there's a whole bunch of stuff that has been funneled here. However, I'll say that it doesn't just get funneled here, like some will be accreted onto the two stars. So, uh, yeah. I still the question, I guess, as to why you preferentially see giants, not. Oh, if they, yeah, if, if indeed the planets all formed in situ, uh, why would you just see giants and not small planets? Uh, no, no idea. Unless maybe one option is that maybe small planets migrate in, so they form here, migrate in, and then suddenly they've got this huge gas reservoir and they just go, aha, and they just suck in all the gas. So maybe all of those small planets became gas giants. That's another option. Sort of, that's like a hybrid option type well, thing. You say you have a, a, a gas reservoir there. I mean, stuff is moving in, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then it, it reaches the stability boundary and it's gone. It either falls in onto the stars or is, is, escapes the system. Well, I mean, as Daniel was saying, he is seeing, a, you know, you can see a pile up of, of stuff. A pile up of stuff. Yeah. Is it significant? Maximum, like, is it a spike kind of thing? Yeah. It's definitely, there's definitely a spike there. It definitely, the distribution sort of goes up, then it drops off quickly as you go here. Does it tend to be arcing or circular arcing, I'd say. Really? Well, I mean, because the eccentricities are, uh, severely, you know, there is more, yeah. Yeah, I think, but even an equal mass binary will, an equal mass circular binary will induce some eccentricity on the disk. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that scenario was not one I've exactly explored. It just seems like a possibility. Awesome. All right, thanks. By the way, you, you mentioned that uh, you, you have only coplanar detections, right? So Correct. Are these progress or retrograde, or, or you don't know? Uh, so we do know that they are prograde. You can tell from the timing that they are prograde and not uh, coplanar but retrograde. Indeed, uh, there are thoughts you could have. This is a discussion we were having earlier, but it seems possible to have. It's definitely possible to have 
retrograde circumbinary discs. I mean, uh, you know, Daniel, I believe, has papers on this. You can have retrograde discs around black hole binaries and stuff. That would not be surprising. Maybe it is even surprising that, okay, you've got 12 planets or 14 planets and they're all prograde. Uh, yeah. The stability boundary will change. So the stability boundary changes. Indeed, the stability boundary gets closer. So you could have a, you could have a retrograde planet closer to the binary, which would also suggest that the disk could be closer. Indeed, the disks can be retrograde disks can be tighter around binaries. That's I think a Nixon paper or something like that. Um, but we don't see any planets. We would have found them. That doesn't make them harder to find. We would have seen them. Awesome. Thank you very much.